under the category of unfair, unfair, unfair. There sure are a lot of stories that, well, it just rubbed the fur the wrong way. And why is it that the rich get richer and the poor get poorer? I already mentioned Mr. Macho Baseball Player last year who publicly angled for a long, multi-year baseball contract in the hundreds of millions, or fo football players. And their comments about it always end up in most of the newspapers, causing them to be booed roundly whenever they come up to the plate. And here's the irony. These young men were born into wealth already. Usually their fathers are very successful businessmen back east, and these athletes are born into millions before their home run power made them candidates for even more money. Every now and then there's a story in the paper about a person who hits the lotto jackpot twice. I mean the big prize. And why? Why does God let that happen? They don't need the money. So here they went $25 million or so the first time around, and then later they match all six numbers a second time. All my brothers and I and my dad enjoy the game of golf. Now maybe you heard about a 49-year-old lady named Jeanette Roberts. She didn't just shoot a hole-in-one in golf. She hit three of them in the space of eight days. And she'd been only playing the game for four years, compared to several sorry lifetimes for some of the rest of us. She's a 35 handicap, which is nothing to write home about. That's about as bad a golfer as you can get. In fact, her scores on the three rounds where she hit these aces were as follows, 101, 91, and another 101. But there in those sky-high scores were three shots that just rolled onto the green and went plink straight into the cup. Now to add insult to even more injury, these three fluke miracles are on top of a fourth hole-in-one that Jeanette had lucked out with earlier there at Granite Bay Country Club. Well, like I say, the world isn't very fair. And as we read through some of the stories that Jesus Christ told, it's clear that we're dealing with the element of unfairness in the gospel message. It's kind of a common theme. Prodigal sons get what they don't deserve. People get invited to banquets they have no business attending. And here in the parable of the three servants and the talents, there's another occurrence of what we might call the bad math of the kingdom. Now, by now, the owner of the estate here in Matthew chapter 25 has heard glowing reports from the two of his financial lieutenants. The man with five talents earned five more. The guy with two suitcases of money also doubled his stake. And now comes servant number three, the man who was only given one measly talent. What kind of answer does he give when the spotlight is shown on him? Here it is, beginning in verse 24. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your talent in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. Well, that's not too good, is it? especially considering that there was a bull market going on and that the other men in the game had both had a return of 100%. So how does the boss respond to this chicken-hearted guy? His master replied, You wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed? Well, then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. And now here's the kicker to the story, where the unfair math pops up again. Take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. For everyone who has will be given more, and he will have an abundance 
and throw out that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Isn't that quite a story? It's interesting that gentle Jesus, meek and mild, seems to have quite a few anecdotes up his sleeve where someone is bodily tossed out into the darkness where the teeth begin to grind in sorrow. But even more important is the fact that the boss takes this one talent from the no-account man and hands it over to the person who's already prospering. Here in Matthew 25, the poor gets poorer and the rich gets richer. And the player who's already gotten a hole in one gets three more in a week. There's so much we could glean from this colorful story. But it certainly seems that the most important thing is to understand the master. That's God, of course. Two of those servants seemed to know the boss quite well. They enjoyed working for him, didn't they? When he gave them a challenge, they got right to work. They invested with zest and enthusiasm. Interestingly, there seems to have been no resentment between them over the fact that one got five talents and the other only two. That's quite a spread, but they didn't mind because they knew and trusted the master. It was his call. That was fine with them. They knew it was his money they were risking. But they also seemed to feel confident and secure that he would love and accept them and be proud of them no matter how they scored in their stock market forays. Now here's another interesting note. How are these two good guys rewarded? Notice how the master pays them. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Did you pick that up? He says to them, you men did good with a little bit of work, so your reward is more work. They went from a small amount of service to a large amount. Is that a reward? Is that a lovely payoff? Most of us, if we turn in a good job and meet a little deadline, aren't that thrilled when the big man in the corner office says to us, good job. Now, here's a huge pile of work with even tighter deadlines. And yet this is the reward for these two workers, increased responsibility. Ah, but then this P.S. Come and share your master's happiness. Maybe remember the King James spin given to that line. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Which follows the more work announcement. I will make thee ruler over many things, which except for the politically minded among us is usually not received as good news. But for these two, it certainly was. They loved and appreciated this master so much that to work for him was a great reward. When he said to them, I've got even bigger jobs for you now, that was by definition entering into the joy of their Lord. And of course, to understand this good master helps render obsolete not only the bad math of the gospel, but the false charge of this wicked servant. It's interesting, by the way, that to do nothing with what God has given us is described by Jesus as not just laziness, but downright wickedness and sin. That's something to think about, isn't it? But now let's examine this false accusation. Investor number three says to the CEO, man, you're a hard boss. You expect to score every time and off the sweat of others. You want to harvest where you didn't plant and gather where you didn't put in any seeds. Well, if in this parable, God is the master, is that a true statement? When we do well for the kingdom, is God gaining a benefit that really didn't come from his original generosity? A missionary sweats in the jungle for years and a few people are baptized in a little mountain stream. They become new Christians. Is God capitalizing on the hard work of that missionary and getting a harvest where he didn't plant? Of course not. It was God who gave that native a conscience. It was God who softened his heart 
The saving Calvary message came from him in the first place. Furthermore, it was God who gave the missionary the talents and the motivation and maybe even the finances to make that mission trek. It's a dynamic living partnership. And I don't know of many missionaries who've ever come home complaining that God was a hard and unfair boss. Most of them say it was the greatest reward of their lives to work for such a master. And they thank God if he gives them 10 cities to rule next time instead of only five. And by the same token, there's no such thing as bad gospel math in God's vineyard. Jeannie and I have been in Russia. We're faithful Christians behind the forbidding Iron Curtain, labored in secrecy for decades with very sparse results. Then here comes a big American TV evangelist and he rents a huge Moscow Olympic Stadium and has enormous crowds and baptizes 15,000 people. Do the workers there complain or do they celebrate? <laughs> the ones I've met rejoice and consider that they are all full partners working for the same miracle working savior. Here in the world of Christian mass media, you know, there are many, many ministries bigger than the voice of prophecy or it is written or faith for today or quiet hour, or amazing facts. And I thank God if he pours on and piles on the blessings for someone who comes on after we do. If some other preachers on your radio dial already has 10 talents and then gets one more, we should praise the Lord, shouldn't we? That those funds are still invested in the same growing bull market. You know, I think I'm going to stop saying bad math. It's starting to add up better and better all the time.